thank you, Mara, for being part of the Speaking Truth to Youth project. I'm really glad to have your time with us today. So, and I just have a few questions I'm going to ask you and looking forward to your answers. So we'll start with what event or beliefs in your youth led you to become an activist? I think I can pinpoint um, some experiences I had and the other is, is more of a singular event. Um, I was lucky enough to live in uh, Spain and then Scotland as a six and a seven year old. And um, so by the time I came back to the US at eight, um, I had already experienced a lot of different cultures and a lot of diversity. And um, I was working on five different languages. And then I came back to the US. And so I would say to adults, and I don't think I was being a brat, I was just interested. I would say, what languages do you speak? And they go, English. And I'd go, oh, okay. Um, and I, I couldn't even understand as an eight-year-old why people wouldn't be excited by learning new things and, and different languages and other cultures. And so that really sort of decentered me in a good way. I already had a sense that the world was bigger than I had known it to be previously. And I think that made me just sort of like so interested in, in difference. But the incident that really stands out in my mind so strongly is I was uh, eight and we were driving from Ohio and we drove through Virginia. And uh, this was uh, in the early 60s. And we stopped at a rest area. So this was my mom, my dad, me, uh, an older brother and a younger sister. And uh, we stopped at a, at a gas station to get gas. And I went off to find the bathroom. And I guess I was trusted to do that at that point by myself. And I saw that there were three bathrooms. And that was like, I didn't quite get it. And they were labeled men, women, and colored. I was just full of sort of shock, confusion, indignation. And I also had the pure kind of understanding that if something was against the law, that meant it couldn't happen. What I also remember about the story is that I tried to ask my parents about it. And they just said, get back in the car, get back in the car. What I realized later was that as Jews traveling in the South during that period, they didn't feel very safe either. And so sort of the indication of where we were and sort of alarm about that made them very short with me. But for me, it also started me on that trajectory of when adults don't talk to kids about injustice or something that's going on, then that's really problematic because it's like, how do you make sense of the world and know what to do about it if people don't want to talk about it? So that really sort of stuck in my mind as the first time that I understood that the world was not even the way we were told it was, that there were things going on that were not fair and not right. And a lot of my work now around anti-bias education really, you know, says it's not just enough to do diversity education, we have to literally push against and teach against some of the misconceptions and stereotypes and prejudice that surround children from the time they're born. Um, and so it has to be very explicit. It's not just children of many lands. That's nice. And I have no objection to the multicultural food potluck. I think that's fine. But we don't want to stop there. We want to also make sure that we're understanding like, what's going on at the border. And yes, that's Mexico and they eat tacos. And what's going on at the border? And why do people respond to Mexicans that way? And, and maybe we should learn some Spanish if we don't know that. And, you know, so really pushing past kind of cultural appreciation to really having a more justice oriented lens of, of understanding sort of what what's happening. And, and, and then another word that I really dislike intensely is tolerance. Tolerance has always seemed like a really kind of shabby goal. Like, you know, I see you, I see how, you know, who you are and I'll tolerate you. And I always say, I don't want my friends to tolerate me. I want them to understand me, value me, appreciate me, stand up for me, whatever. I don't want to be just tolerated. So what continues to motivate you to be an activist or what guides you, what gives you courage? I um, am 
Jewish. And there is a principle in Judaism, which is called tikkun olam, the repair of the world. And it is one that really guides my work. It really says that it's our obligation to make the world better. Uh, I think understanding that that there's brokenness out there that needs to be repaired uh, is really the first step. And then the next step is what can I do about any piece of that brokenness? I think it's really important in working with young people to say, at every age, there is something you can do. You know, if you're four years old and you see somebody being teased on the playground, you can do something. As a four-year-old, you can go over and talk to that child who's been teased. You can talk to the teacher about it. You can figure out something. And then the next step is, what is it we can do, right? So that you're not acting alone, uh, that you're acting in solidarity with other people, and that you are having what you do informed by other people. Um, that sometimes people go off on a, oh, I'm going to do this because it'll be good. And then it's like, well, did you check with the people you think you're being an ally for? Or so the understanding that before we kind of rush in with some kind of savior mentality or sort of wanting to do that, we check with somebody if we possibly can. Would this be helpful? How would you feel about that? Or I did this in support of you. Did that feel right? Was that good? Or was there something else I should have done? I think it's being alert to what's going on, reading, talking to people, listening. Um, as I said, you know, I hear things all the time where I'm like, wow, I never thought of that. I didn't know that. I, I have middle-class privilege. I never dawned on me that canceling these bus routes was going to have this implication for people who, you know, like, it's like, how do I, go, wow, how do I understand things? Not just through my own very limited lens, but um, through other people. And so it became really clear to me to be an effective activist. You have to have connections and relationships with other people. You can't do it, you know, from your study, you know, um, you have to do it in a way that's authentic and real. And that means building relationships across um, identities and people that you don't know, or maybe don't go to your church or don't, you know, shop where you shop. And how can you use, you know, every opportunity to learn more and to build relationships? I would say that's what gives me sort of the juice to keep, to keep going. What advice do you have for young activists and for youth in general? The first advice is learn, learn, learn talk, read, explore. In this day and age, you know, with the internet, it's really not reasonable to say, well, I don't know anything about Islam. It's like, well, okay. You know, what can you learn? Who can you talk to? Is there a mosque that's open um, for you to visit? You know, what would it be like if all children were raised with, wow, I don't know anything about that. Tell me more about it. Why do you wear that Thing on your head what does it what does it mean to you oh it's a hijab and it's part of my faith you know like not like oh that's weird you know that's strange or like tell me that food you're eating i've never seen ki what's it called kimchi can, can i taste it i've never heard of that you know you know how could we have this attitude of just interest um instead of judgment uh or fear um and I think that starts very early. One of the reasons it's so appalling what's going on in Florida and other places is, you know, denying, you know, uh, young people the opportunity to learn about enslaved people, about uh, queer people, about, you know, like, how can we become good advocates and activists if we, if we don't know anything? So I guess the first advice was learn, learn, learn. The second advice is, and not just because I am an elder now, but talk to your elders. Ask them for their stories, um, you know, sort of learn the stories. And then the third piece of advice is don't act alone. Seek out other people for support, for courage. In terms of taking action, it's sort of notice injustice, have the courage to do something about it, and then have some strategies. You know, what do you do? What do you try? Um, when I talk to youth, one of the things that they always connect with is when, what do you do when people tell a racist joke or a sexist joke or, you know, um, 
how do you challenge it? How do you interrupt it? Do you have some strategies? You know, are there some things you could do or say that might be like, you know, Mike, I don't find that funny. Tell me why that's funny. And, you know, like, you know, I know people who are on welfare and that's not my experience of their lives at all. Or, you know, like, how do you sort of have a conversation that interrupts that kind of, of behavior, you know, in a way that might be effective and to have a lot of strategies. Strategy when you're standing next to a stranger in the grocery store might be different than when it's your uncle Fred at Thanksgiving. Learn as much as you can know that you will make mistakes and learn to apologize and move on. Thank you so much, Mara. This has been great. I, thank you so much.